Hello lovely people, welcome to my January reading wrap up. The main reading mood of January was very chunky non-fictions, but I think I have got a bit of a even fiction non-fiction split, so what I thought I would do is alternate them throughout this video. So I'm going to kick off with um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Painter and Poet by Jan Marsh. Um, this is a biography of the pre-Raphaelite painter and poet Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Um, Jan Marsh is a very big name in pre-Raphaelite scholarship. She's written lots and lots of books. She has also um, edited a lot of Rossetti's poetry into collections and stuff like this. I previously have only read quite a light one of her books, so it was really great to dive into such a big comprehensive biography. I really, really loved reading this. I feel like this did a really great job of um, taking an unflinching look at Rossetti. He was not a man without flaws, but also um, presenting quite a balanced view, some of these aspects of his life that get very sensationalised, like uh, <laughs> exhuming the body of your dead wife to get your poetry back example, um, are handled in a way that's very nuanced, that sort of um, acknowledges all the sides of the story and all of that kind of thing. So um, I just found this, this was a five star read for me, I just found it so brilliant. I, I really, really enjoyed the reading of it. I know that people often are afraid of reading nonfiction in case it's dry. This did not feel dry to me, although it did feel extremely thorough and comprehensive. Um, it quoted extensively from primary sources, from his letters, from his writings. Um, it, I just, I just absolutely loved it. And Rossetti is my favourite pre-Raphaelite painter because he's the one who I, I loved first. We had this proserpine in my house and as a little red-headed girl, the pre-Raphaelites were very much something that I became very emotionally attached to. But as I've got older, I just still continue to find them so interesting to read about. Um, I've never really connected with Rossetti's poetry. I really like his painting, but I've never really found his poetry that engaging. But it was really interesting to get an insight into his growth, his development in both of those areas. Um, yeah, it was it was really fab. I would really recommend it if you're in any way interested in pre-Raphaelites. I am thinking of putting together a pre-Raphaelite sort of book recommendation video because Anna Maria Actual Spinster um, sort of requested it and whilst I don't have comprehensive knowledge, I definitely have read enough that I would feel comfortable putting together like some good places to start. So maybe I'll get around to that soon, but this was really, really fab and I'd really recommend Jan Marsh just as like a general concept. The actual first book that I finished this year was The Split by Laura Kay. This is, well, I was under the impression that this was a rom-com. Really, I'd say that it is more of a contemporary that has romantic elements and comedic elements. <laughs> so The Split, I'm so sorry, I forgot everyone's character names. I do this every single time. But um, our main character, her girlfriend breaks up with her, to her mind, very unexpectedly. Um, and so she takes a bunch, she just packs a bag, she takes the cat and she goes and she goes um, to stay with her dad. Um, and she kind of, it's mainly about her being a bit lost. She connects with this old friend um, that she used to go to school with. They were both sort of like the, the gay kids at school. So they sort of banded together a bit, but they've lost touch. Um, she joins, she starts running <laughs> to try and get her life in order. And then there's sort of like vaguely a romance, but a lot of it is that she has this idea in her head of, of the fact that they'll, she'll somehow convince her girlfriend, I remember Emily's name, she'll somehow convince Emily to take her back. And we kind of go from there. It's very like slice of life. One thing I really liked about it is that I do think that Laura Kay seems like she's got a really good humour. Like when I was reading the book, I kind of felt like I would enjoy like going to the pub with her. Um, the main character I did like. I think I found her a bit grating after a while because... Um, and there's the, at the very centre of this is this belief that she has that she can just convince this ex-girlfriend to to get back with her, and she writes her these really long emails that are deeply misguided, <laughs> and I think just 
for the amount of this book where she seems to be acting as if she somehow thinks that she can make it work again with this girl it just makes me feel like she's very delusional and after a while it becomes quite hard to marry up like the growth that she is making in her life with this continual like holding on to this aspect uh i don't know the the main thing i loved about this was the side characters um and again main character's dad God, I love that man. Just like absolutely in my heart. Really pure character. And I think a lot of the characters that you really connect with are those side characters. They bring a lot of humour, but they also bring a lot of heart to the story. And I really liked that. There is sort of a romantic subplot. And I I think that, again, that was an element that I didn't really like because she, she behaves in, in a way that is understandable for someone who is coming out of a very long-term relationship and all of that. But the way that it's sort of posited in the text... It kind of frames it as if, like, oh, she didn't do anything that badly, whereas I think some of the ways that she will have hurt this other person are really valid, and I don't really feel like that's grappled with. So I will say that as, like, a romantic comedy, I don't think it fully works on that front. As, like, a fun book where you sort of explore someone who's going through a time of change and the people in their lives, that bit worked really great for me. Another non-fiction, this is Fabric, The Hidden History of the Material World by Victoria Finley. This was another five-star reads for me. It's been a really good uh, non-fiction month. This is largely a non-fiction book that is about fabric and it is split by the different chapters are each different fabrics like cotton and wool and that kind of stuff and we very much delve into history of fabric. Um, we explore lots of different things to do with that. Usually there is one sort of th thread if you will that carries you through the chapter um but there is also part of this as well that is very much like a grief memoir the author um had this idea for this book while she was helping to look after her dad who was um kind very much end of life care sort of thing and then she very unexpectedly lost her mum first and that was deeply unexpected and and the grief really reverberates throughout this book um, and if you want a book that is purely fabric history, that bit might not hit for you. You might not be invested in it. Something about this time of year, just like grief books really hit, I feel for me, um, sort of autumn, winter, because that tends to be, that's, you know, when I lost my grand quite recently, that was autumn, winter and that kind of thing. So I actually found that very moving and I found that the way that it manifested itself into the, all of these different journeys that she goes on to look at fabric, but that are so intrinsically linked to a lot of the time, the relationship she had with her mum and the plans that they had and the things that they were going to do together. I found those aspects actually deeply moving and I found the exploration of fabric history absolutely fascinating um really in depth um some of the chapters i liked the best were um bark cloth and tapa and that kind of stuff these are fabric histories that i really didn't know much about whereas some of the stuff to do with cotton and wool because i do like reading non-fiction books about fabric they were a bit more familiar but i just thought this was fabulous and wonderful and i really really connected with it on to fiction we have dogs at the perimeter by madeleine tien um this is part of my attempt to when i really like a book by an author make sure that i read more than one book by them do not say we have nothing is just a masterful book that i just think does such beautiful things to do do with grief and music and family history and all that kind of stuff I think it was great this is sort of exploring Cambodian history and um, Cambodian genocide and all that kind of stuff so uh, it's similar to do not say we have nothing it is exploring uh, a very fraught um, and emotional part of history I think this didn't work so as well for me it's interesting because I would be very interested to read what Madeleine Tien writes next because where this fell down for me, and I think it's where I'm comparing it to Do Not Say We Have Nothing, is the lack of character depth. I really felt that. Like, it's it's a much more fragmentary novel in that we have a main character who does lots of things to do with um, um, helping people who are experiencing illnesses like dementia where there is the disconnect between um the way you th like brain stuff to do with your brain she does scientific things <laughs> that's about as specific as i can get um and there is a fragmentary aspect to this narrative that i think fell in with that really interestingly um and we go back and forward in time a bit and all of that and we sit with her 
now and you can see the way that this history still really impacts her and it, the way that she interacts with the world and is closed off in some ways and all that kind of thing and then you go back to her past and you really see like the horrific stuff that she experienced that her family experienced and all that kind of stuff so I don't think it's a bad book at all I think what stopped me loving this was because you do spend quite a lot of the start with this fragmentary aspect it is almost like it's deliberately trying to keep you feeling like you don't fully understand what's happening and that you have to piece things together and all of that kind of thing but then the result of that is that I didn't feel as connected to this book and I still think that she writes beautifully I'm not sure if I'm going to read any more of her backlog because if uh, like one of them's a short story collection stuff like that and if I'm feeling like this isn't deep enough for me I think I'm going to wait and see if she writes anything else that is a much fuller novel I think um, so I, do, I don't think this is bad at all, but I do think that this suffers from having read it after reading this glorious book by her. Back to non-fiction, this is Renoir's Dancer, The Secret Life of Suzanne Valadon by Catherine Hewitt. This is all about Suzanne Valadon, who is this uh, woman here. She uh, was an artist's model initially, so she did pose for Renoir, she posed for a lot of very famous artists. She was also a creator in her own right. She um, was a painter, she was very much like a bohemian in that particular moment in Paris. Um, she had relationships, both romantic and also just friendships, with so many people. Like, um, Degas was her mentor for a while, he really saw her art and really nurtured her. She had a really strong relationship with Toulouse Lautrec and all this kind of thing, so she's very much one of those people who was in a very vibrant moment and interacted with a lot of people that you'll probably recognise the names of. Um, I had heard of Suzanne Valadon, but I had never really um, learnt much about her and this was great. I, I much preferred this to Catherine Hewitt's other book and it's not, I don't think The Mistress of Paris was bad, but I think Suzanne Valadon is a much more interesting person, I have to confess. Um, just the, the journey she goes on and getting a real insight into her own creativity but then also her son as a painter is extremely lauded both in and in his time he was very highly regarded and a lot of the time her own artistic efforts were sort of framed in a way of like oh she's a good painter but even more important she's the mum of this great painter that we all like so it was really great to be able to appreciate her and her own creativity and her style and all that kind of thing um, my one critique of Catherine Hewitt as an author actually is I felt the same with this as I did with The Mistress of Paris is that actually sometimes I just think she is ever so slightly too glowing of the people she writes about just in regards to occasionally I wanted just a little bit more critical thought being applied like for example Suzanne Valadon's son uh, struggled with alcoholism frankly since he was a child and um I think her role in the way that her behaviour exacerbated that was was kind of let off a little bit lightly. And she's just, she's so, she's so glowing and she loves her so much and I really admire that and I can really feel it and it's one of the things that makes this a delightful book to read. I think just that actual like critical distance and occasionally being able to criticise the person that you're writing about um, is is quite important I don't know but I still I really really enjoyed this one and this is actually where I would recommend if you're interested in Catherine Hewitt I think that this one is my favorite so far I believe that she has a third one out by now I don't remember it's about another artist who I don't know very well so maybe one day I'll get to that as well we shall see I also read a graphic novel. This is The Dancing Plague by Gareth Brooks. This is just as a as a piece of media so exciting to me. So it is a graphic novel and it has this combination of I cannot remember what it is called, but burning, like burning the pages is like a real feature and also embroidery. So I don't know how well you can see this scene. It's the actual people are drawn, but then all of these divine and demonic aspects are um, embroidered. And that is something that recurs throughout. And then as is this, this method of burning the pages, and that comes to have significance as the story goes on, is it's not just something that's being done for aesthetic effect. It actually does have um, meaning to, to the story. Here's another example of what I'm talking about with the embroidery. So I think as a, as a physical media, like, wow, what a concept. This is to do with the dancing plague. There were a number of dancing plagues in history that really happened. This one is Strasbourg in 1518. Um, 
And there's lots and lots of different ideas for what caused Dancing Plague. Like, is it like mass hysteria? Is it to do with this particular thing that grows on plants in times of drought? Like, there's so many different concepts. And this isn't really trying to answer the question of like, what caused it? It's more looking at this moment in history. And there's, there's kind of these two women that we focus on. And we have two sort of different timelines happening. Um, and really like the rallying end point is the way that we don't listen to women and we don't value women's stories and um, that kind of a thing. There's there's very much like a, a sort of female mystics vision from God aspect here and how that's interpreted when it is a woman who, and also a woman of particular class and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's an element that is looking at um, the corruption of man, like, uh, she's the the person in the fifteen eighteen plotline. It's like she's seeing the dancing plague, but she can see these these devils that are causing it and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it was definitely a, an interesting, cool time. I think with regards to the art style, the actual style of like how the people are drawn is not really my jam. I think sometimes I wanted just a little more differentiation, to be honest with you, between um the main character in the two timelines and everyone else because a lot of the time they they look exactly the same as the other people in the scene so that can sometimes be just a little bit tricky when you're trying to like follow the narrative um and plot wise i think that this is a book that is less about giving you a really in-depth plot and more about like a snapshot and then capturing these other aspects so i do really like that um, I think it seems really interesting and I'd be, I, I want to look into what else Gareth Brooks might have done because as, as just like an entity, I'm so thrilled that this exists. I just think it's so cool. A nonfiction that I DNF'd is Fake History from Mozart's Murder to Cleopatra's Asp by Graham MacDonald. Um, to be honest with you, I, my dad gave this to me because he was like, oh, I do some stuff uh, in my day job to do with creating historical content for kids and all that kind of stuff. And he was like, oh, I thought it might be useful. Um, we do lots of, you know, what myths are real, what it's like a misunderstanding, like all that kind of stuff. Um, I thought this would be more helpful for that. To be honest with you, if you know history, this is a bit of a reductive book to read. I did start reading it and it's just stuff like, oh, did you know Joan of Arc wasn't executed for witchcraft? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. Like, so I think if you're someone who doesn't really read history and is interested to find out if some of these ideas that you have about history are real, this is probably a great, super accessible, very, very easy read um, for sure. If you are someone who does like history, you probably don't need to read this. And I got part, like, I got about 80 pages in and I was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to be more, uh, curated in my reading, I think, and to just give up on things if they're not working out. A book I read for my Read the World project is The Longest Memory by Fred Dagois. I read this for Guyana. This is a very, very short book. Um, it's super impactful. We're essentially set on a plantation in the South of America and we have this inciting incident which is um, an enslaved man tries to run away and he is punished and the punishment leads to his death. And every chapter we go to a different perspective. Occasionally we return to the same person's perspective but we, we move around in time. So we start off um, with this boy's dad and we see the role that his father had in this and then we move from different people to different people um, and we're very much showing um, a snapshot of this moment in time the way that slavery is so corrupting you know you get to see the way that his father tries to embody that idea of like the good slave and then it, it gives him nothing he he still loses his child we get to see the way that um, someone in the house, well, the, the the master of the house views himself as very enlightened and he thinks that you should create an atmosphere where your slaves are happy and all of this and yet still suffering and death entail. Like, it very much is sort of showing you that there there is no way of doing this that is not utterly dehumanising, that is uh, damaging to all society really and all this kind of stuff um, I think it is very well done in that way I know that it's studied a lot and I definitely understand why this would be a narrative that you would study because these changing perspectives and the way that they are like narratively put together I think like 
you could absolutely do an A-level essay on this and that kind of thing for sure. My next non-fiction is Strong Female Character by Fern Brady. Fern Brady is a Scottish comedian who I got to know through Taskmaster, as I'm sure a lot of other people did, but I really liked her on that and I heard great things about this book. Um, it's a memoir of her life growing up. She was diagnosed as autistic quite late in life and the memoir is very much about focusing on um, viewing her her life through the lens of like, yeah, turns out I was autistic all this time and that explains so much about why all these things happened to me. Um, I thought it was really well done. I really appreciated reading it. Um, I think that it did, she did such a good job of combining kind of like her very lived experience and then linking up to like broader observations on specifically what it's like to be autistic as a woman and as a woman who gets diagnosed later and how the different traits manifest in different ways and all that kind of thing. Um, my only critique of this actually, this would have been a full five star read, but I do think that it gets a little bit. Um, she spends quite a lot of time talking about how stuff like uh, people are just horrible to her because she doesn't understand the so like she's not working to the same social cues that they are and she just doesn't understand things that they think that she's acting a certain way deliberately and she just isn't um and so she does focus a lot on the way that like people treat her badly as a result of that i just think that she also veers into that a bit in some of her descriptions of other people there's quite there's a lot that is I think there's some internalized fat phobia there with her and that kind of thing so that's what stopped me from giving this five stars but I do think it's immensely well put together um I have a couple of people in my life who are late diagnosed autistic girls and I will be passing this on to them so that they can have a bit of a read of it because I think it's something that they'll find really really um they'll have a real connection with the next two books both come via my dad this is Feral and Foe by Dan Abner and Richard Elson this is a 2000 AD comic. The basic concept of this is essentially like, what happens to all the orcs after Lord of the Rings ends? <laughs> so our two main characters were henchmen for the big bad. The big conflict has happened. He lost. And now they're like, what do we do with ourselves? And there's this, this feral and foe is like, um, instead of what you can do is you can essentially sign up to the good guy side and you can be like, okay, they won't kill you. And in return, you have to hunt all the people that you used to be friends with. Um, I had a really fun time with this, actually. I think this is potentially of all the comics that my dad has bought me lately. I think this is my, might be my favourite. It was a really good um, engagement with genre and all of that kind of thing. Like, if you like fantasy, fantasy tropes, all of that, like, it's playing around with them in a really fun way. Um, it has some cool lore going on. It was a nice pick-me-up. The other book from my dad, this one he lent me, I bought him this for Christmas myself. This is The Art of Darkness, The History of Goth by John Robb. It is a chunky one. When I say it's been the season for chunky non-fictions, I wasn't lying. Um, this was interesting. I will say I think this is a bit of a weird reading experience. So this is The History of Goth. Um, goth music, but at the very start of this, he does sort of go into the origins of Gothic. So you go a bit into like what Gothic is in that sort of realm. And then um, starting classical music, we go through I, like a big kudos acknowledging like the roots of goth music that's in black culture and all that kind of stuff. Moving into um, Bowie, Mark Bolan, that kind of an era. And then from there we go, <laughs> like we go through this, like whole chapters dedicated to certain bands. I think... Um, the writing style of this is very florid in a way that I think works for discussing gothic as a concept. I think it matches that genre really well. Um, so some people will find this massively overwritten. That bit didn't really bother me. What I found strange, I think, was just the amount of where the focus was. I feel like it took us a good like 450 pages to reach anyone who actually self-describes as goth because we did a lot that was like precursor to goth and I understand having to like lay those foundations um and then we did a bunch of people who probably who they explicitly said that they they have the term goth applied to them but they don't like it and it took a while before we actually got to anyone who was like I am goth 
and I read a review that said that they heard that this began life as a book that was about post-punk and that would make a lot of sense for me because I swear the words post-punk are used far more than the words goth are and a lot of this focus was just on bands that aren't they don't they don't identify as goth and so then as it became more contemporary like there's maybe two chapters at the end where we talk about like contemporary goth culture um and we just go through a bunch of bands very very quickly whereas i'm like i it, it's very strange to go from reading massive chapters that are about these bands like joy division and the cure and all of this who don't identify as goth and then to just whiz through a bunch of actual goth bands so quickly at the end my roots like i i really like stuff like sisters of mercy all about eve the mission all that kind of stuff like i like that um, but also, I grew up listening to a lot of what I would call like symphonic goth metal, like that kind of thing. And I like Lacuna Coil gets a pass, gets a, gets a one mention in a sentence. Like I don't know, it just feels weird that we just spend so much time on what is not goth, and then when we finally reach contemporary goth, like we're just like, oh, it's done. And I just, it was just, it was weird. Um, I also will say that it left a really bad taste in my mouth. I did not read the notes as I was going, because this is a big book, and my hands are so small. Um, so I sort of skimmed the notes at the end, and boy, I kind of wish I hadn't, because there were some notes in here that I just really rubbed me the wrong way. On two separate occasions, he refers to a trans woman's male genitalia, uh, which was unnecessary information in the first place. Uh, and then look at your language and just casually throws the tea slur in so i i i i i'm glad i read it in that it i have got a whole playlist of bands that i'm now going to go away and listen to and all that kind of stuff and that's great and at its best it was like an interesting look at times in musical history it's just a history of goth i i, I don't know if that's what i've taken from that you know i don't know Back to fiction, I've got uh, The Romance of Tristan by Beyrule. This is a medieval classic. This is the earliest um, remaining account that we have of the uh, Tristan and Isolt myth, which is part of, it's connected to Arthurian mythos in that Tristan becomes one of Arthur's knights at some point. But um, Tristan is the nephew of Mark, who is the king of Cornwall. And um, Isolt is the daughter, she's an Irish princess. And essentially Tristan goes over to get Isolt to take her back to Mark. They accidentally drink a love potion. They fall in love with each other. And obviously tragedy ensues. Um, th in this version of the mythos, it is really weird, actually. Um, it, it, I like reading medieval romances and that kind of stuff because of like... Uh, genre history moments in time this myth that we know that's been retold like what are these origins and all that kind of stuff super interesting it's such an interesting framing like by all intents and purposes this is an adulterous relationship and yet the narrator of this constantly sides with Tristan and Isolde like Mark is uh, rightfully suspicious of them and it's framed as if it's like how could he doubt you and it's like but he's doubted like <laughs> he should doubt you you're having a massive affair <laughs> and it's so funny to read like a medieval Christian the Celt that is like trying to posit like them as blameless which in some you know this this idea of the love potion I think is is it's almost like oh it's it's almost been ordained by God because it's this thing that they did didn't choose to do um but also like on that note it's so funny because the love potion lasts three years exactly and then it stops and then it stops and then they realize actually no they're still in love with each other i don't know so it's it's just it's not necessarily like the most fun read i'm gonna read you something that is in the introduction which is so funny um this is from the introduction to this book Beryl's poem is sadly defective by modern standards, for it is far from easy to imagine that a piece of narrative fiction can exist as a serious work of art while dispensing with elements as fundamental as a coherent plot, an ordered flow of events with a clearly discernible causal nexus, and convincing characterization. And then the person who owned this has just written in capital letters, NONE, and underlined it. <laughs> So I already knew going in, I was like, okay, maybe lower expectations. So not like a text that has set my soul on fire, but certainly interesting from literary history perspective and uh, 
that was that was fun. I listened to The Chiffon Trenches by Andre Leon Talley, which is read by the author. This is actually a reread for me. I read this for the first time on my library app before I realised that I don't like reading on my phone. I listened to it on the library app and um, because I knew Andre Leon Talley's narration would would make this. Um, if you don't know Andre Leon Talley, he was a very famous figure in fashion. He was um, a black man who worked in Vogue, I believe, until quite recently was the, the most powerful black man in fashion for having that role. Um, it has now, there's other people and that's wonderful. But for a while he was um, very much on his own in that respect. And he was very good friends with Anna Wintour until they had a falling out. He was very good friends with Karl Lagerfeld until they had a falling out. I got to know him because he was a judge on America's Next Top Model when I was a teenager. But he just had such a fantastic way of speaking and delivering. So I knew that hearing him narrate his audiobook would be wonderful, and it was. And I think it took the edge off some of those moments which, when I read it the first time around, got a little bit tedious of just listing, like fashion people and events and I went to this event and I wore this thing and this person was at this event and they wore this thing which when he's delivering it is wonderful but when you're sat trying to read it on your phone before you've realised that you don't like reading on your phone not as fun very interesting to hear about this particular moment in fashion it's very much like a moment I feel particularly fashion journalism that has passed like as I'm recording this like Condé Nast has just made massive layoffs and all that kind of thing so this mo this this descriptions that he has of working with Vogue and working with other fashion magazines and the lifestyle and all of that like I just I question I don't think that lifestyle exists anymore the moments of fashion the fashion designers that he was really close with like there's a lot of really interesting stuff from that angle there's very much um sort of a sense of him getting his side of the story across while also not really burning too many bridges. This is still very much like a three-star read for me, but re-listening to it on audiobook was definitely a good way to go. Finally, oh I think, okay, maybe my 50-50 split was generous because I have two, I guess I have two fictions to talk about. Um, I'll go for Blood March by Tracy Dion. This is the second book, uh, sequel to Legend Born. This is like an Arthurian YA series. I am very much in the minority, but I didn't love this. Um, I've just, I, what is it with me at the moment? I didn't love Redemptor by Jordan of Waco. I have not loved this one as much as I liked Legendborn. Uh, I, I hope that when the next book comes out and I read it, it's going to make me change my mind about this book because currently this just feels like such a second book syndrome to me. I don't know. Um, it's this Arthurian world. Brie is, um, she's a black student at this college, college uh, in America and she sort of infiltrates this secret society that is all based around um, King Arthur and lineage and all this kind of stuff. By now, shenanigans have happened. Um, I just feel like the pacing of this book, this is over 500 pages, and we just wander around. We go here, we go there, we talk about whether we should find Nick, we talk about a bit more whether we should find Nick, and then we talk a little bit more about whether we should find Nick. Um, <laughs> I just feel like um, so much of this book was uh, Cell, angst with Cell, and also, like, Brie and Cell angst, but in a way, like, they really felt like they took a step back in their relationships and then they were at the end of book one. Like, three months have passed between then and now, and we're still just being, like, really angsty with each other. I just feel like so much of the plot was to just give them angsty moments, um, wander around a bit, and then info dump, like, 36% of the way through, I, like, made note, and I was like just feel like I've received loads and loads of information and people critiqued the first book for being very info dumpy but I was really in it and I was like yes there's a lot of information but like we're really setting up the world I just a lot of that is irrelevant in this book and we just have to get a, a bunch more info dumping um and I think it's frustrating because what I loved about the first book is I loved Brie I thought she was a wonderful heroine and like the journey that you go on with her I don't know I just loved it and I just feel like this one, a lot of the time, we just, she's either being very, very stubborn and rejecting her powers and all of that, or then suddenly flipping and needing and being like, I must be as powerful as possible. And I just, that I just found it really frustrating. There's a whole thing to do with um, some interactions she has that's to do with Vera's line and all of this. And I really like, 
can't talk about it because it's a massive spoiler. How that was handled, like, just felt so weird and jarring, and I don't know. So this is my waffly way of saying that I know loads of people loved this, and if you loved it, I'm so happy for you. I wanted to love this. I tried to make this a month where everything I read would be, like, either just I'm following a niche whim, or I think it's going to be a five-star read. I really tried to kick off the year well, and I did. But Blood March just did not hit for me, and I'm really sad about it. <laughs> The final book I'll talk about was a five-star read, and I absolutely loved it. It's Pictures by J.R.R. Tolkien. It's J.R.R. Tolkien's art about Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and all of that kind of, so all of his work to do. Um, it's it's super chill. It's just like, here's an artwork, here's an explanation about it. I loved this. I loved this so much. This man just never stopped being talented. Um, it's really interesting to see how ideas developed. I really want to copy some of the designs. Like, I'm obsessed with these ones that are, like, right at the end. I have just utterly... Utter, these are just doodles. Incredible. Incredible. I'm obsessed. I want to try and copy some of the patterns and learn how to draw them myself. Um, so that was just stunning. 10 out of 10. Tolkien has... Oh. Tolkien has my heart and I love him. That's everything I read. That's everything I wanted to talk about. Um, I definitely have feel like I've kicked the month off, the year off, in a in a great way. Overall, this is really positive, and a lot of these non-fiction books I'm absolutely positive are gonna show up in my best non-fiction books of 2024, um, for sure. I would really, really love to hear if you have read any of these. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Or what is the best book you read in January? How did you kick off your year? Was there a reading mood? How are you feeling? I've had a lot of art books for sure. I want to keep carrying that over into February. I'm loving it. It's making me feel really inspired. Um, but yes, in the meantime, hope you're having a lovely day. I will see you next time for something different.